Hi, y'all. I'm not sure how I can follow up from this awesome talk by Asim, but see, yeah, I'll try. Um, yeah, just uh, Asim asked um, if in a few years uh, machine learning will be able to produce uh, web pages if just we type in the specs. I am always very skeptical about this, but uh, with this awesome tool that I'm going to present today, there might be a solution because this awesome tool runs some audits to your application, so if an application is generated, then maybe it can make it better. So, uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about the Lighthouse tool. How many of you are web developers and have used the Lighthouse tool? Okay, good. Um, so yeah, my initial thought was uh, calling this presentation OMG, I'm doing everything wrong and a face screaming with fear. Uh, but yeah, then I thought this was not so good. Then I thought that I should name it. I knew it was right all along and put an Hermione Granger GIF, but they wouldn't let me put a GIF in the title. So yeah, I ended up with exploring the lighthouse. So what we're going to talk about today I'm, we're going to talk about what Lighthouse is, uh, how you can use it and how you should use it, what audits it offers, uh, we're going to see it in action, we're going to see a web app I created and how I made it score, good, get good scores, and then we're going to embrace the fact that we're, going, we're doing some things wrong and what we can do about this. So who am I and why am I talking about this? Uh, I'm Katrina, okay, I'm a Google developer expert for Angular, and this is the first talk I do that is not related to Angular ever, so you're lucky. Uh, I'm a software engineer at this dot. I co-organize Angular Athens with some friends. Uh, I'm a web and Angular enthusiast, and I love cats and chocolates. So I also love the Lighthouse tool because it's all neat and it shows me what I'm doing wrong, what I'm doing right, and I think that more people should use it because it's making the web better. So what is the Lighthouse really? Um, as it says in their GitHub repo, uh, the Lighthouse is a tool containing a beacon light to guide developers. So it's basically a lighthouse to keep developers on the right track in a sort of way, just to keep you away from rocks and things that are bad practices and guide you towards the better web. Uh, so what it does is uh, it runs a number of audits on your page and produces a report that you can afterwards read and see what you're doing wrong and what you could be doing better. So how can you use it and how you should use it? So at the moment, there are four ways to use it. Uh, first, it's the audits tab in the Chrome developer tools. The second is the Chrome Lighthouse extension. It's all grayed out here because it's not the, the most recommended way to use it because you need to install something and why should you install something if you already have it in your browser. Uh, you can also use it with the, with the node command line tool. So, there is a node module that you can download and uh, run from your command line and you can also there customize it, uh, add some custom audits, uh, exclude audits that you don't need and use it in your own custom way as you want it. And you can also add it in your continuous integration systems as a node module so that it's uh, in your process of uh, building and deploying your application. Uh, actually, the, a lot of um, a lot of repos on GitHub uh, have Lighthouse uh, when you're doing a pull request, so they first run your pull request in, through the Lighthouse to see if it matches the scores they need, and then they approve it, for example. How should you use it? Uh, first, you need to define your needs and your audience. So the Lighthouse tool is not a panacea. Uh, it does check for accessibility, for performance in flaky networks, for compatibility with mobile devices, uh, for the ability of your application to be a progressive web app, uh, for search engine optimization and all, but not all applications need all of this. So use it as you need to use it and don't just take it for granted for everything, of course. 
Uh, but then it's always good to follow some best practices when building things. So yeah, there you go. Um, how should you use it? Uh, we mentioned the, the automation tools that you can add in your continuous integration systems or anything, but you can also use it as you go. Um, like when you're developing an application and you always have your um, developer tools open, just uh, you can check um, at your audits tab uh, usually to see how your scores go in the things that you need. Uh, this will produce results. The results can be either in a graphical user interface or you can download a JSON file with everything you need. And uh, then you can see what you want to change and what you don't want to change. So let's see an example. Let's actually run in here, Lighthouse, to see how uh, the Google Slides uh, perform in the presentation mode. So, yeah, we are on Chrome, obviously. So, okay, I'm going to just zoom in a bit. So, yeah, you get the Audits tab. Here's the Lighthouse. You can choose, okay, we, we can test it on desktop. Let's check for everything. Let's run an all audits. Then you can add some network throttling. And then you start the audit. So as you see on the left of the screen, Lighthouse will, will run your page through audits. It will try to load it through networks. Uh, through different types of networks, like simulate a 3G network or simulate it offline. Let's see how that appears. Okay, it's loading. Yeah, and as it's loading, it's giving you some tips uh, on why you should be using it. Um, yeah, so the most usual thing that they say is that if a page takes more than three th seconds to load, then you're losing your mobile users. Uh, so yeah, it's almost there. Let's see. Come on. Yeah, I don't know it's why it's so slow now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, now it's checking how it's it in, with no internet, with no JavaScript. And soon we're going to have a report ready. Almost there. Okay, so uh, this is what the report looks like. I hope you can see it. So yeah, as we can see, uh, the Google Slides uh, presentation is not very good for a progressive web app because it doesn't need to be a progressive web app. It's not very good for performance because maybe it doesn't have to be so performant in 3G networks since it slides and has pictures and everything. It's very good with accessibility, some best practices and some CEO. So um, as you scroll, you can see uh, the, how the loading of your page looks uh, in milliseconds. And then you can see all the diagnostics. I'm just scrolling through these and we're going to see them in more detail. Um, okay, let's reload. So, yeah. So where were we? We were here. Um, so, we're going to see this later. So what audits does it offer? Uh, we saw that it offers performance audits uh, for progressive web applications, for accessibility, which are my favorite audits, uh, the best practices, and search engine optimization. So now we're going to see some of the, my favorite things from each topic because we cannot see everything from every topic. There are very many. So first thing you need to do for performance, one of the things you have to do is uh, watch out for your CSS. So first of all, you, you can defer unused CSS, either CSS that is CSS uh, style sheets that are used uh, 
less or they're not critical for the first render, you can defer loading them. You can always tree check your CSS, that is remove rules that are not used. And you can do this uh, with, uh, with plugins in Webpack or in your Gulp. And then you can include critical for render CSS rules in your head. Like um, each time you, you link a style sheet, obviously it's another uh, network call and it slows down the loading. So if you have some critical CSS like your, your fonts that are without sheriffs or some colors or some the, the first things that you see on your page, you can add these styles inside your head in a style tag so that you're sure that the first thing your users see uh, is something that is like the final version of your site. Uh, and always uh, you can minify your CSS, again using your gulp or whatever other, else you're use, whatever other thing you're using to pack your application to uh, reduce the load time. Also pay attention to the fold. Uh, there's this thing we call below the fold and above the fold. So imagine a newspaper, I'm sure that most of you know it, that, but imagine a newspaper. So a newspaper you fold it and uh, whatever is above the fold is the thing that people see. It's the same way with web applications. So what is above the fold is the, the, the thing that uh, most users see when they first load the application. Uh, so make sure that uh, your, everything that is above the fold uh, looks good on the first load and uh, try to try to defer maybe loading things that are below the fold. So you can lazy load resources that are not visible at a point when they are about to be visible. So I'm going to show an example later. So you can use Intersection Observer to take care of that uh, or your favorite frameworks lazy loader. Uh, so let's see an example. So this is my great uh, presentation of what is above the fold. So this is the application we're going to see later. So it's a page I made that is, uh, that takes almost 100% score on Lighthouse. And it's, uh, here is, it's on a mobile, so that's why it's so long. So if we were talking about the fold, this would be above the fold. And uh, this would be, the, that would be resources that could be loaded later with, uh, uh, could be lazy loaded to reduce the load time. So how you could use an intersection observer, you could uh, use the intersection observer in API and you could uh, intersect uh, some pixels or an element at these two points and uh, when, when the user would reach that point, you could load the first resource and when the user uh, would reach the other point, load the other research. And that would uh, decrease the initial loading time because some users might never reach the bottom pictures and you wouldn't want to make a heavy load for them if they're not going to use them anywhere. So, other things you can do for performance is optimize your images, uh, which means that uh, Okay, decrease image sizes, uh, uh, only load uh, sizes that your users are going to see. For example, if you're displaying an image that the largest that is going to be is like uh, 500 pixels, don't load a version of it that is 2000 pixels. There's no point in that. And uh, also you can use next generation formats uh, that have a better compression like WebP or JPEG 2000 and you can use uh, a new application that does that, that is Squoosh, that you can add your images there and run them through some optimization techniques, see how they look and download them. And uh, yeah, they can really, really reduce size. Uh, also check your painting times. Um, so you want in the first uh, one to two milliseconds to get something on screen because uh, if users see nothing on screen, especially mobile users within the first uh, uh, three seconds, they're going to leave your page. So you can either add some small elements there, uh, like here, these are very light, some text, a title or something, or you can use skeleton loading like YouTube does or LinkedIn does, I think, where when you see, when you first log on YouTube, for example, or LinkedIn, 
you just see some gray boxes where the actual content is going to be. And this is called skeleton loading, and it loads instantly because it's just uh, CSS and some divs there. So you can use that as a technique so that you can have a first paint very quickly. Um, then, some things that you can do to score higher on progressive web app scores. So what are progressive web apps? I'm sure all of you know. Who doesn't know? Nobody? Okay, good. Uh, so I'm not going to explain. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, uh, progressive web apps are web applications that actually can be, in a way, installed on your phones. So you can add a home screen button on your phone, and then you can click it, and the page will open on your browser, but it will not, uh, it will look like a native application without it being a native application. It will not have a URL, it will just, uh, it will look like a native, it, you will have the experience of a native application. And how you can achieve that? Uh, a first step to do is add a manifest JSON file. So a manifest JSON file contains metadata associated with the web application. Like uh, it contains the application's name, a description, uh, links to some icons to use when you add your page and application on your home page, uh, the preferred URL that you want your application to start with, also default orientation, display mode, whether you want it on full screen or not, the, the, whether you want the URL bar or not, that is, and also a scope for your application, like if you have a URL and then have some slash and some deeper URL to define the scope for it. So uh, for my application that we're going to see later, this is the manifest. So the necessary things that you need to add in the manifest to have a PWA are these. So you need the short name, you need the name, you need some icons that are at least 192 pixels square, and you need a start URL, the background color, the display and the theme color. The theme color is the color that the address bar is going to take whenever your users go onto the site. So, uh, also, uh, apart from the manifest, you have to add the theme color in your index HTML in the meta tag named theme color. And then the service worker. Uh, I will assume that some of you know what the service worker is. Uh, so the service worker uh, is sort of like a proxy that uh, is between uh, the browser, like the client, and uh, the web. And uh, it's uh, all requests uh, are go uh, through the service worker. So uh, the service worker listen. Uh, the service worker for PWA must listen to install, fetch, and activate events. And it must make sure your app will work online, offline in a way at least. It has to respond with a 200 uh, response code, which is success. Uh, and how does it do that? The service worker must use a cache. And uh, working as a proxy, it must respond with a cache version in case, uh, the, in case you're offline. So how do you do it? First of all, in your Entry, in your app entry point, like the main JS, you register a service worker if it's available for your browser. Uh, here, for example, in the application we're doing, I'm giving a scope to the service worker because I will be using GitHub Pages and I have a URL that is uh, githubpages.com slash explorer. So you can give it a scope and every URL that is beneath that scope will uh, follow the same service worker. Um, and uh, here, oops, uh, you install the service worker. So what it does here, it's, it caches uh, my index HTML. It caches the styles, because even if I am offline, I want to see a styled application. And, uh, Instead of caching all the images I'm showing on the slide, it will cache a placeholder for the images when I'm offline. So this is the offline PNG. And uh, here is how it, the service worker will respond to fetch events. 
So each time our browser makes a request to the network, it fires a fetch event. Uh, the service worker will be listening to that event and uh, it will respond to this event in the following way. First, it will search in the cache if there is a request, if there is already a request for that. So, for example, if we are requesting for index HTML, I cannot see what you're showing. Ah, 15 minutes, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so if uh, it's requesting for index HTML or if it's requesting for CSS, it will respond with the cache version. So we're good there. We take a 200 okay response. Um, and it will return the response from the cache. Otherwise, it will uh, try to connect to the internet and get a response. If that fails, and it will fail for a lot of things, but if it fails for our images, what we're going to do is we're going to intercept that request and respond with the offline uh, image placeholder. So this is just the way I implemented it. It's not, you don't have to do it that way. All you have to do is have a cache and uh, respond with the cache response so that uh, every time you get a response to 100. Uh, another two little things you have to do for a PWA is to serve over HTTPS and you can't even use a service worker if you don't. And uh, if everything is right and the users are interacting and engaging with your application, they will be prompted to install the web app. So uh, this, is going, this is how the application we're going to see in a while will look like. So up there you have the theme colors, which is magenta because I like pink. And then the home screen button, uh, the home screen uh, prompt will pop up. So uh, as far as accessibility is concerned, um, accessibility, I think, is the easiest thing to do right because you have all the right tools and it's not so complicated, but also it's the easiest thing to do wrong. Uh, so what Lighthouse will do is it will check uh, your page as a screen reader and it will check if screen readers can understand and navigate your page and engage with it fully. But there are more things in accessibility that you should check by yourself and they cannot be tested by the Lighthouse. Uh, so naming, first of all. <coughs> give buttons a descriptive name and uh, also give links a descriptive name. So what does that mean with buttons? Uh, think of a, uh, a hamburger button that you have to open a menu. It just has three lines. You need to add a name for it, an area label maybe, so that screen readers can understand that this is a menu button. Also give links a descriptive name. Uh, Lighthouse will check your links. Uh, if the, the text within the links is things like here, this, this here. Uh, so yeah, you can replace that with a more descriptive thing. Like instead of saying you can read about kitten diet here, you can add the kitten diet in the link. So that's, uh, we know that this is a link with kitten diet tips. Uh, what you also have to do is uh, use ARIA attributes. Uh, ARIA is accessible rich internet application attributes and uh, these are read by screen readers again to inform your readers about the elements and use role attributes too. Um, so uh, role attributes are, are a lot. They can be for buttons. They can be to inform your users that what they're seeing is a tab or it's a tab panel, and these can be very helpful if somebody is uh, going around your application without seeing, seeing it or going around it with a screen reader. Um, also take care of clickable elements. So if you have a clickable element that is not a button element, or you have to add a roll button at the tab index, uh, that will make it foxable by a screen reader or by other methods of navigating a web application like keyboard navigation. Uh, as, best, uh, as far as best practice are concerned, there's lots to do here, but uh, the main rule of thumb is uh, don't use dangerous things like document write or deprecated APIs or libraries that have non-vulnerabilities. 
and also use some common sense, like uh, don't start uh, popping up notifications on page load and distract your users and annoy them, or have autoplay in videos or whatever you have it. And uh, search engine optimization, uh, lots to do here again. Some lighthouses will check, some not. So you have to add a description meta tag uh, and a title meta tag so that these help uh, search engines and web crawlers. Um, you can add a rel canonical link tag, which will uh, tell uh, if there are multiple versions of your page, like a mobile version or a desktop version or a lighter version. Uh, the canonical link will tell web crawlers, uh, web crawlers which uh, version of your page to actually crawl. And uh, then some common sense things that if you want SEO, don't, uh, SEO, don't block your page from indexing and don't include an invalid robots.txt. Another tip for search engine optimization that Lighthouse will not check is structured data, but we're not going to talk about that now, but you can check it yourself. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see it in action. Uh, yeah, don't ruin that link yet. So, <coughs> say that we're starting off, let me rearrange my windows. Yeah. So, uh, let's say we're starting off with a simple index HTML file. We have a very simple head that contains just the link to the styles. We have some simple text here and some other things. Uh, some images, uh, we are embedding YouTube, we are embedding Twitter, and uh, finally we are linking asynchronously the scripts. Uh, so this is uh, running now on my local host, so let's see what uh, what uh, scores it would get just this simple page on Lighthouse. We have to check it on mobile because I care about it being responsive. So yeah, let's run the audits and hope this time it's a bit faster, thanks to my 4G. <coughs> and it being smaller than Google Sheets, of course. <coughs> So, of course, uh, we have a lot of performance issues because I'm loading huge uh, PNGs and JPEGs down here. It's not a progressive web app because it's not fast enough. It does not respond with a 200 when we are flying. It does not direct any traffic to anywhere. It doesn't have a viewport meta tag or anything. Um, it's not uh, very accessible. Why? because we don't have alt attributes in our images, our iframes do not have a title. So let's change a few things. I'm not going to, to live type, sorry. Okay, actually we're going to go a few steps. Okay, so now our code should be updated, we're not. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, now we, we went a few steps ahead and we added the viewport meta tag. We added a description, a theme color, a manifest, some icons. Let's see at the manifest uh, file now. It has all the icons we need, the theme color that you saw before. What else did we do? We add the alt uh, attributes. We changed our images to be WebP. We add the tab index and roll button to our image that is not a button but it is clickable because it has an on-click um, event handler. So let's see what the updated version would get. Let's refresh. Actually, yeah. Let's clear everything and refresh. Oh, no. So if you go to the application tab now, you can see that the, the manifest is loaded. You get your theme color. You get your, no, you don't get a service worker, why? Yeah, maybe we don't have a service worker yet on this step. So let's see the performance now without the service worker. No, uh, sorry, the audits. 
let's perform a new audit. Again, let's hope it's fast. And see how it improved. OK, so now all the scores are good because we added all the things, just some simple tags in the index HTML file and some image changes. And instantly, your scores are green and you're close to 100%. The only problem is a progressive web app because we don't have a placeholder. So let's go to the final step. <coughs> and uh, see how this changed. So now we have a service worker and we're registering it as well. So now we should see in the application that we have a service worker that is activated and running. So if we perform an aud a new audit now, you should take all the highest scores. And what is more, we're going to see how it looks when it's offline. Yeah, so there you go, almost 100. <laughs> And uh, yeah, if we go, let me see, if we go offline and we refresh, then our placeholder image is uh, replacing all the images. So as you see, the two images we had down here are now uh, are replaced by our placeholder. Um, you can, yeah. Yeah, and if we refresh with network, we get it. So where is, okay. So you can go in this link and this is the application. So you can open it, I'll leave you a moment to open it on your phones and you can see it. You can see if you engage a bit with it, uh, open it a couple of times then it will ask you to uh, install the PWA and you can refresh, you can see the theme colors and obviously I'm going to give you the code in the end. But uh, the takeaway message is that it's really, really simple to fix just a few things to have a performant application or have better scores at the Lighthouse or whatever you, you name it. Uh, so as we saw, it's just some head tags. It's just um, take care of your images, take care of your service worker, and you're good to go. So maybe, maybe some of you are thinking, I'm doing everything wrong, now what should I do? Well, chances are you're not doing everything wrong, obviously. Uh, as we said, the lighthouse is not a panacea. Uh, first of all, define your goal. As mentioned in the intro, uh, you need to see which audits apply to your website. Not all audits apply to every website. Think of your use case scenarios. Think of what you need to achieve, Think of what your client wants to achieve by the web app you're building. Do you really need search engine optimization if, you need, if you're building a web application that will be used uh, in the internal systems of a company, say? Or do you need the best performance there is? Also, recognize your audience and your users. Not all pages are for everyone. Not all web apps need to be responsive. For example, that internal application that you have for your company maybe doesn't need to be responsive. Not all web apps need to be accessible because not all web apps are going to, to be used by everyone and maybe you don't need everyone to use your application. Maybe you just want to do a demo or maybe you just need an application to, I don't know, do whatever you want but uh, you don't need everybody to use it. Uh, your audience and users differ, differ each time, so you, so you have to define if you really need good performance in band end works, if you really need responsiveness, if you need the PWA in the end. So yeah, don't fret, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so what, so start using Lighthouse not as a single source of truth, uh, but as a general guide pointing you towards a general good. Uh, in any case, you can customize your audits. Uh, as we said, uh, if you are using the CLI tool or even with uh, the Chrome Dev tools, you can click uh, which audits you want to check and target these things that you really need and after you clearly identify them first. 
Uh, so I have some links if you want to read more. So I'm going to uh, post this these uh, slides on Twitter. And uh, yeah, you can copy the link of the slides and click on the links I provide or just follow me on Twitter. It's CyberCity, it's my handle. And I'm going to post everything there and you can shoot me questions or anything. So yeah, thank you.